We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Hello, Mavs fans. Welcome to Pod Mavericks After Dark. I'm Kirk Henderson, joined as always by Josh Bow. It's a little after 10 p.m. on Monday, October 28th. The Dallas Mavericks just defeated the Utah Jazz 110 to 102. Josh, how's it going? It's going pretty good. Uh, I appreciate that the game picked up in the second half because it was a little bit of a slog to start, but then it ended pretty well. I'm not just saying genuinely the the win loss. Obviously, it's good the Mavericks won for us and and for everyone watching. But when when that that first quarter, I was kind of like, is this going to be one of those podcasts where we got to start <laughs> getting cranky or or something? Because it was a very sloppy game. But so I'm glad it turned out well, so we could talk about some more fun stuff. Well, and and here's a comparison I made during the playback. Which, for those of you who want even more of me, and I wouldn't want more, and I just, I don't understand it, but if you want to hang out with David Trink and Matthew Phillips and I during the game, we're doing hosting playback rooms. Um, really easy app. You can, I post links and stuff everywhere. I'm not going to talk about it too much, but during that, during that instance, I basically compared this to the, the NFL's first four games of the season. Um, where if Luke is not playing and, and, you know, he's not playing in the preseason, so they don't get any chance to tune things up and NBA teams don't take preseason seriously anymore. It reminds me of the first two to two to four games of the NFL season where things are garbage in the NFL. Like, do you remember when the, it, it felt like only yesterday that the saints were like putting up 50 spots on teams and now they can't score anymore. It, it's because teams are still figuring things out early in the year. The Mavericks have a lot of things to figure out. They just do. Um, I, I'm, I'm enjoying the muck to a degree. So it's like on, on what planet are the Dallas Mavericks ever going to get a, what was Luco ended up five of 22, Let's be clear that five of 22 was misleading with how good his shooting was because for a significant portion of the game, he was three of 18. Like he was bad. It was at least, you know, shooting the ball and offensively. And, and it's kind of a, a, a theme where if you look at Lucas had stretches of shooting this season where he's caught fire in the first two games, which have elevated his shooting numbers. He's had no consistency. And so for the Mavericks to have a game where, where he's pretty bad, um and they survive it is just you know in, in days gone by they wouldn't have been able to do that so you know on the one hand are you annoyed that they couldn't blow out a utah jazz team that's not very good absolutely i'm pretty annoying or i'm pretty annoyed at the concept yes i am also annoying um on the other hand like i just kind of want them to rack up wins you know against the suns i don't i don't did you watch any of that game the other night 
No, I had to I had to catch the highlights afterwards. They played like a yeah. team that expected things were going to work out for them, and they didn't. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, I heard it was, and it was very much a familiar game for Mavs fans in the Luca era. It was that mm-hmm. Luca kind of does everything, and no one else really. Well, they you know. just couldn't find it. I mean, Kyrie was was so inept in the in that game, whereas tonight he really found something. I mean, the the eight of fourteen, extremely efficient, nine assists, six boards. Um, he he attacked the rim with a little more emphasis. Whereas against the Suns, the Mavericks were 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 getting mid range floaters, and, stuff, and they just couldn't convert anything. So, you know, you're watching them tonight. I tend to yell at my TV and stuff as I'm watching games. I just kind of want them to rack up wins and start to figure things out. Do you know what I mean? Like right now, the thing I really want to talk about, interestingly enough, was just one of the more fun PJ Washington games that we've ever had. Like that was the highlight of the game for me. Yeah, yeah. He was great. He didn't make any of his threes, but still impacted the game in a lot of different ways. I mean, 11 rebounds, which is great for him. Two assists, four steals, two blocks. Like He, he was, was everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And, and every definition of the word, everywhere. Like, literally felt like every time they needed some type of play, uh, he was there to make it. Um, and if he's not going to be able, you know, this is something I think I said when he got traded here, was I think a lot of people focused on his, his kind of somewhat floundering three-point percentage in Charlotte. And obviously he needs to shoot better. He can't, you know, he can't be a sub 30, you know, he can't really be like below 34%. He needs to get to 34, 35, 36. He doesn't need to be elite, but he just needs to get, he needs to get closer to league average. But while he's still struggling with his shot, the thing that I noticed, I said at the time, and it just kind of bears out, obviously they're playing jazz. That's a lottery team. They stink, but. The Mavericks don't need his three-point shooting as much as they just need everything else, and especially just like his athleticism. And his athleticism really showed out against a Jazz team that has like some decent front court players, like Laurie Markinen and Walker Kessler and John Collins and uh, Taylor Hendricks. Before you know, obviously, uh, you know, not great with his really horrific uh, lower leg injury. But the Jazz are are you know they're not a good team, but they are pretty decently sized uh and and pretty athletic as well in their front court so this was a good challenge for the mavericks front court as well and pj was awesome he he made the jazz look like a small team like the mavericks out rebounded the jazz oh no 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 no. it was even 50 50 the jazz did get 15 offensive rebounds um but i don't know if that was necessarily because they were kind of out muscling the mavericks it just felt like a lot of you know the mavericks didn't shoot particularly well from three they were 28 percent. so there were a lot of there were a lot of long uh, misses there and the jazz also didn't shoot well and they had they shot 10 and 35 from three there were a lot of long rebounds that went out to the perimeter so i wouldn't necessarily say that was like a size issue but i, I felt like the mavericks front court made the the, the jazz look kind of small uh, in a lot of funny way in a lot of weird ways or just a, maybe less athletic and i well, think there was a big part of that and this is something else that i don't think we've had enough games really to talk about yet i my eyes and I need to watch more tape. I'm not quite as good at this as you are. My eyes are telling me the Mavericks are perfectly willing switching just about everything they're seeing. And yeah. they're doing that because they're enormous. The Mavericks as a team are enormous. So when the front line is both big and plays big, you get games like tonight where it feels like there's just times where you can't get anything near the basket. And that's nice. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's it's a follow up of what they did to close the season in the playoff and then make the playoff run last year is they have two dominant rim protectors uh, and they know it and they kind of let those two guys play center field and they funnel teams to the basket uh, and they just shut off the paint like you just don't consistently score at the rim against the Mavericks, except for, you know, the, bl- uh, the blown coverage. And that's kind of right. what they hang their hat on. To the extent that they'll even give up some threes, uh, like the Jazz shot attempted 35 three pointers tonight, which is a decent, you know, a decent amount. Uh, and the Mavericks are kind of like, okay, you know, we're kind of going to live with you guys getting the occasional, you know, open wing three. They did a good job of limiting them from the corners. The Jazz only shot uh, seven total corner threes, mm. uh, which is not, you know, not like a great number, but like pretty, pretty good number. Uh, they shot 28 above the break threes. Like the Mavericks defense is we will shut off the paint. We will shut off the rim. Mm-hmm. Will that lead to an occasional kick out? 
you know, yep. above the break, sure. But we don't think you're going to make enough of those threes to outweigh the fact that you're not getting layups or you're not getting, uh, you know, easy buckets consistently. Mm-hmm. Uh, and mm-hmm. and that kind of that's that bore out today. And you know, the Jazz did not have a good shooting night. They're 37 percent from the floor. Um, you know, they mav- they did have a couple. You know, they did s- score 40. But they scored 46 points in the paint, so that's kind of a high number. But they only shot uh, 54.8 percent at the rim, uh, which is below league average. So uh, it was more. They just had a lot of volume because they just kind of threw themselves at the Mavericks, big big men defenders, and and Lively and Gafford. And for the most part, they held up. So I mean, the Mavericks had 60 points in the paint themselves. So like this was, you know, the Mavericks dominated the paint and they won, and that was kind of the formula they rode to the finals last year. Well, hmm, I, I and and I'm. What just, are you thinking about? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I, okay. I, the front court stuff is fun because I was like, "Are you ready to talk about that?" <laughs> no, because like we're okay. dipping into the Gafford Lively stuff, yeah. and Mark Stein apparently. I I don't know this because I don't watch the Dallas DLLS pre-show, but he said something to the effect, according to somebody I trust. That that it, he's not entirely sure that that Gafford would want to go to the bench, so Gafford can continues to start, but played fewer minutes, and he wasn't good tonight. I mean, he wasn't terrible, but he just he's kind of a net neutral when he's out there sometimes, and and maybe if he can act like he finished his first Luca lob tonight that I can remember for a dunk this season, and like that'll start to clear up some of the muck. Um, but for now, I just I don't really I don't really want to I don't want to talk about it. Do you like? Is it interesting to you? Tell me why it's interesting. Well, it's interesting because I don't know. It feels so obvious. I mean, it's not just that Lively is that good. I mean, there are times when Lively feels like the second best or second most important player on the team, and I would even argue in a game like tonight when Luca didn't really have it and didn't need to have it. I mean, it was between him and Kyrie were your best players on the floor. And Kyrie plays 36 minutes and Lively played 26. And the Jazz are within two possessions with three minutes left in the fourth quarter and Gafford is in and Lively isn't. And you're just kind of like, what's what's going on here? Because Gafford is a good player and he's not old. Like he's still relatively, like I think he's 26. Like he's not like an old vet that needs to be kind of shuffled off to the side. He's still a a very important contributor to the team and the identity of the team, because I think it's a big deal that it's either him or lively in the, like pretty much playing the entire game. Like, I think that's a big deal, Mm -hmm. Uh, but the minutes and the starting thing just seems a little, a little out of whack. And I don't know if it's because they're just still, I mean, I not ready to give the keys to lively as a, as a 20 offense is garbage early. Luca's being bad early in the first, and I honestly think it has something to do with with the connection he has with Lively over Gafford. But I, I I'm not married enough to that opinion without enough further thoughts. It's yeah. just kind of odd. It is odd, and I know that we, you know, we are fa- we are covering a team. You know, we were rabid fans uh, watching Jason Terry, That's one right. of the best Dallas Mavericks ever, and he came off the bench for most of his career. Now that's like a weird example because there's just a bit more precedent for, you know, scoring guards to come off the bench uh, instead of start. Although that's, you know, that doesn't really happen as much. It can't be. So Bill Simmons in in his, his ginormous book of basketball, it's behind me somewhere talks about what, what Isaiah Thomas and uh, some other NBA player referred to as the disease of more. Like you win a championship, you want more. I never seen anything. You don't get to want more. Gafford, I value Gafford a lot. I think he's fantastic. But he was on flotsam teams his entire career until he comes here. He was not valued. The Mavericks got him for very little, relatively speaking. Luka has ele- and the Mavericks have elevated his value. I appreciate wanting to try it out. Right, Nathan in the chat says Gafford has been a part-time starter for most of his career. If he's concerned about the next payday, I actually do understand that. These are prime earning years. But we got to be real about what we're doing here. And if it starts to affect the winning, 
the Mavericks are going to have to 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 really make some choices because he's going to be in the top seven of the rotation regardless. He's too important. No, I know. Um, and I think one of the things is it's there's two things kind of fall up there. You said when it affects winning, they're two and one. And we both know coach, they don't, they're not going to make changes if they don't lose. So it's going to keep going this way if they can keep stringing together wins. So that's one thing for anyone that's like really upset about it. That's like wondering if they're ever going to change it. You know, one, we're three games in and two, they're two and one. So they're not like coaches don't normally make moves after a team wins a game. Uh, That's just not how it works. And then the other part of it is, you know, I think there's another response is kind of like, well, who cares who, who, starts you know it just matters about is he playing more and finishing and i get that too but we're through three games and lively is averaging uh, about 25 minutes a game and he averaged about 23 and a half minutes a game last season and call me old-fashioned i want your best players to play 30 minutes a game (laughs) And I know that with bigs, it's different. And there's there's maybe more stamina issues with your bigs and sure. foul trouble. And there's a lot more that goes into it uh, than that. But I would just love to see what Gafford, what Lively looks like playing like 33 to 34 minutes a night. And he played 26 minutes tonight, you know, off the floor in key stretches in the fourth quarter when the Jazz were making runs. You know, it's not worth throwing a stink over. It's just, to me, Lively is just... He's so good. Like I just, I'm just kind of in sh- in awe of how good he is, and also just I don't re- recall similar. You know, like it's a it's a weird situation because it's not like lively is this kid that's cut, like he was the twelfth overall pick. He was the player that they tanked their season to get. Like right. he is he is the he is the him and Luca are the future of this team. You know. Kyrie is 32, I think. Clay is in his mid 30s. Like Luca and Lively will be here. Of all the players on this roster, they're the ones you can own. They're the only two players on this roster that you can point and say they will be here in five to seven years. Can we can we talk um, about one lively so, specific thing? That while we're perseverating, for lack of a better term. You want to talk about how good he was tonight? Because the- we talk about <laughs> that that eight foot floater. <laughs> Holy shit. Isn't it? I'm telling you, every game he does something where you're like, oh, I didn't know he can do that. So, so for those of you who, who may not remember the shot, he's in the middle of the key and he kind of takes like a Draymond Green-esque little teardrop. I, I'm not describing it correctly because big men just don't really do this stuff. Um, And I don't know how often he'll ever shoot this shot because if the shot is a threat, what's going to happen is teams will play him tighter which means lively will dunk the ball more. Like you, if if he's a threat to shoot from eight feet, uh, <laughs> sorry, great comment in the chat made me laugh. Um, if he's a threat to 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 do a little push shot, kind of like uh, who is the big man that we had last year that we got from Sacramento? Uh, Rashawn Holmes. Rashawn Holmes had a he just had, Holmes in his like like peak prime playing days has a had a beautiful push shot, and if lively gets anything like that at all. It just is another layer to the onion that makes him nearly impossible to 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 stop to to guard. He he is terrifying. He's done something every game where, you know, if you're comparing him, and I did this over the summer, so I'm guilty of it. So if you're comparing him to Wemby and Chet, you're kind of rolling your eyes, right? But if right. you're comparing him to, I don't know, everyone else, you're like, holy shit, this guy's amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, I understand. And he was, I mean, he put on a defensive clinic all game, especially the first quarter, his ability to hang on switches with Jordan Clarkson, uh, which is a big deal because if you remember, and I mean, obviously this is the the jazz. Um, so, you know, it's, this isn't, I'm about to compare it. I'm not trying to compare the jazz to the Celtics is what I'm trying to say. But if you remember in the series against the Celtics, a big thing that, limited gaff uh, lively's effectiveness and where he finally started to look like a 20 year old in the playoffs is uh he didn't switch very well against the the celtics uh perimeter players now again celtics historically dominant nba champions utah jazz lottery bound non-playoff team bad team so i'm not trying to say like this is 
you know, he's fixed it. But you, you play who's in front of you, and he looked great in, on, on switches against perimeter players tonight, and that was a bugaboo for him at times last season. Uh, his confidence is better. He looks stronger, and he looks bigger. I know everyone says that about guys early in the season, like muscle watch and all that. But, like, his confidence is there, like, offensively. Like, he was already picking this up last year, but offensively he just looks like he knows what he wants to do. Like, you know, he was already starting to show that last year. But, yeah, he just, for, you know, outside of, you know, he's not a pick-and-pop big, I feel like he's just got so much in his bag for that rim-running archetype. Like, he's just starting to grow so the floater is so that. much more the the floating ish like the the shot I'm, I'm just raving about is so much more dangerous to what the mavericks do than him being a pick and pop shooter could ever be you think so i do because if you give him the ball within 15 feet you know the options that he could do or put the ball on the floor with either hand shoot that weird shot pass out of it or it, it, it's just it's different than him catching and shooting. You know, one of my criticisms of Wemby in game one was that he took a lot of like random long threes because no one was in front of him in no small part because that's kind of his best option. He doesn't have a great handle. I don't need Lively to have a great handle if he's within 12 to 15 feet of the hoop because one dribble and he's there. I yeah. don't know. Maybe no, I'm no, 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 that's a big deal. And like just him, him being confident handling the ball in those situations whether it's a floater or if he gets on the floater he can drive he doesn't need to shoot but just being a threat when he catches it and it's not in the restricted area we've talked we talked about it after game one it just opens up so much more when a big man can't play five feet off him when he catches the ball at the elbow if the big man has to play up guess what there's no big man by the rim anymore so you know what that opens up Either it opens up his drive because if he gets by that big man, there's no help, or that opens up backdoor cuts because there's no big man to guard the rim and rotate over to help since most teams are playing, you know, run rim protector on the floor at a time, and it's usually going to be guarding lively. And I think, you know, team, you know, the Celtics, again, great team, tried to neutralize that by putting like Jason Tatum on lively so that they still had their big close to the basket. So that's what teams are going to have to adjust to, but that's making teams adjust to you is such a big part about winning in the NBA is like, you have to get teams off of what they want to do and get them into the second or third option. Cause once they adjust to you, you're kind of dictating the terms and you're not letting, you know, and that makes such a big difference. And that's why Lively's development and just the way he's kind of exceeding his role. Uh, it's just, I mean, it, it just, it's the sky's the limit. And maybe that's me getting greedy when we talk about, he needs to start, um over over Gafford but really it's just like he's the future of this team outside of Luka Doncic and it's just if he finishes and again we're three games in if I had to guess by the all-star break probably starting probably getting close to that 30 minute per game mark barring you know injuries or something but like he shouldn't be a 24 minute per game guy you know I just I just believe that I just think he should be playing more so. All right, so we're well past the halfway point, which is my fault because uh, I normally <laughs> dictate the flow of the show. But for those of you who are here uh, and haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, please consider doing so. Um, anybody that's watching the video after the fact, please leave us a comment. Uh, those of you who are subscribed, click that bell. The bell is the important part. The bell notifies you of when we go live, which is after every game. Every game. Um, for those of you who are listening on an audio stream, please rate and review. Love to see some of the reviews we've gotten on Spotify and Apple. Very much appreciate it. And, and, you know, as much as I appreciate the ones that are positive, the ones that are excoriating me, because nobody is ever mean about you. It's always mean about me. Um, it's really, really funny. Just really funny. Um, all right. So what we're going to need from everybody here, uh, is to remember that I'm going to host a secondary live show after this podcast, probably not too long. Cause there's just not as much to discuss again, three games in we're, we're trying not to perseverate as I tell my, my eight year old son, like stop freaking out over everything, but that's kind of what sports are for. Would rather freak out over that than something meaningful. So if you guys want to hang out with us, um, please do, uh, you can come up on stage and talk about the show with us. Really want to, uh you know keep going with these live shows uh, last thing i'm trying to think if there's anything else i have to plug pop on over to mavs moneyball we've got some new riders this season 
Um, Michael, who's on the last show, did a, he, he's doing a really nice job, like kind of willfully pumping out content after every game, even though I keep telling him to relax. Uh, we have lots of things up. So we'll be back also, you know, just to, in case you're, you you cut out before the end of the show, we'll be back tomorrow night. This is one of the Mavericks' first, uh, one of the few back-to-backs they play. You know, they don't play as many back-to-backs this season. They play the Magic. They're not Magic. Minnesota tomorrow night, like they're probably on the plane already. Uh, and Josh and I will be back covering that game. Um, all right. So I'm going to leave some space for ads here, and then Josh and I will be right back. Now, two pigeons bemoaning the fact you can stream DirecTV satellite-free. These humans can stream all the top-rated national news channels on DirecTV, and now with no satellite dish. This just in. Weather, sports, election coverage. DirecTV has it all, but something is missing. The satellite dish. What are you doing? I'm reporting the news. Back to you, Bob. Here's some news. You're a buffoon. Stream the top-rated national news channels. No satellite dish. Visit directtv.com. Internet required. Top-rated news based on 2023 Nielsen ratings. This episode is brought to you by Allstate. Some people just know they could save hundreds on car insurance by checking Allstate first. Like you know to check you have the tickets in your wallet first before you drive two hours to the big game. Seriously, you had one job. Now the closest you'll get to the 50-yard line is parking lot D. Yeah, checking first is smart. So check Allstate first for a quote that could save you hundreds. You're in good hands with Allstate. Savings vary. Terms apply. Allstate Fire and Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Northbrook, Illinois. All right. What else should we talk about? Uh, you want to go? Can I go in a little bit more? You hinted at it in the first before we went to break, but I kind of wanted to talk about like not necessarily Luca, but like the ability for them to somewhat i mean i don't know if this was comfortable they weren't up double digits the whole game but like i never had doubt that they were going to lose this game and luca didn't really have to do much and he had a bad game but it didn't feel like felt like it mattered and like that's kind of a big deal right like i know it's against the jazz and the jazz aren't very good and there are moments in the first half where i was wondering if they should relegate the jazz when they need to bring in a new team in seattle or vegas or the nba is going to expand because that was horrible um the jazz did not look like a good team but i mean this was something we've talked about before where like if the mavericks want to go to where they want to go luca cannot be a 36 37 usage percent usage player and for long stretch like when they open the third quarter Luca had, I think, really one meaningful possession where he scored on kind of a fast break. Otherwise, they weren't, he wasn't even like running the show. Like they were using Kyrie, they were using Clay off ball, running sets for him. Uh, I don't know. Like, again, they need to do this against a team better than the Jazz before we start, you know, throwing parades that they've kind of solved this problem. But <laughs> like, it's good that they can get through games without it feeling Luca needing to hold the ball the whole game. And again, I'm not trying to say that's like a knock on Luca. It's just sometimes the games have dictated that he has to do everything with the roster construction and then the way the team is, is put together and they've got a team that can like kind of do stuff without him. And, and that was, that was fun to watch at times. I thought it was different, you know? Yeah. I'm like third happy. quarter. They like Luca. I don't think ran a pick and roll like in the first four or five minutes or didn't feel like he well did. see that's kind of a different discussion because as we were watching um together i feel like the mavericks haven't run offense <laughs> like i don't know what <laughs> one of the shit that they're running like they were shooting so poorly from three until Kyrie hit a pair of threes at the end of the was it the end of the first might yeah, have been the end of the first quarter threes. where the threes that he took both both were bad Sorry, they were one. It, one each one was like the the, the last one was uh, end of shot clock. You know, I'm pulling up in your face, and the one prior was a single screen pull up three. Kyrie doesn't take bad shots. That's not what I mean. I don't mean to say that it's it's more of a this is not happening within the flow of the Mavericks offense. Like I'm having a hard time analyzing anything right now. And I think I'm they're not, doing. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just I'm not particularly good at this, so I could be wrong, but it it feels like they're. Between the rotations and trying people, trying things, it's hard for me to get a read on this team past, well, if they're stumbling around in the dark and winning, that's good. Yeah, that's fair. And I think it's a lot of unsettledness. Like, unsettled would be the word to describe the offense through three games. Like, 
you can definitely tell this is a team that's got new pieces and new parts. Clay yes. is a new a new starter. They've got a their bench feels almost brand new for the most part. Um, so there's a lot to incorporate. And then there's also the fact that they basically didn't have a real preseason for the most part. So you combine those two factors. I don't think it, I think it helps explain some of the sluggishness. And then the other part is like, you know, Luca hasn't, you know, Luca's their best player and he's had two out of the three games he's played. He's looked a little worse for wear. He's been under, he was 36% in the first game, 22.7% from the floor in this game. So he sandwiched that, you know, Sandwich between his awesome 40 burger against the Suns. You know, he's had two for Lucas standards, relatively mediocre games. And again, he didn't play in the preseason and he hurt his calf like the first day. So, like, that's not his fault. But that adds to some of it. And also, like, it's very clear that they're trying to get incorporate clay and they're doing stuff with clay that they don't, you know, the only t- player they had that, that could do the stuff clay would do was Tim Hardaway Jr. And uh-huh. Tim Hardaway Jr. How even at his feeling is that my goodness <laughs> and even tim Hardaway jr at his best was not as important to the team as someone like clay is you know what i mean yeah so like yeah they had someone like clay in the sense that they had someone that can run through off ball action and shoot like an off a movement shooter which was tim but tim was mostly a bench was a bench player didn't always close games wasn't a fo- focal point of the team Clay obviously is, and he's like it's important to the Mavericks that he plays well, and he's got a, he's he's a starter, and he's playing high minutes. So, I think that that affects some of it as well. And you know, we'll we'll see if that if that clears up with as they kind of like set the rotation because I think they didn't have the same rotation tonight as they did against the Suns. Like Dinwiddie was the first guard off the bench. Hardy and Grimes had kind of been first guards off the benches the previous two games. I think so they're going to need to settle into the a rhythm of like their eight, nine man rotation eventually. And I think that'll help clear things up. Um, but yeah, I understand like it had their offense hasn't looked great in, in yeah. three games. Well, and so I'm noticing in the comments and I don't want to over index the, the, the comments of people who are here live. I also don't mean to slight anybody that is here live, but I will say I've seen this on Twitter, saw this in the chat that, that we were doing during playback. Early in the season, there's always consternation over like guys that come in as let's just say seven, eight, nine, ten guys. So whether you want to call that Najee Marshall to Jaden Hardy to Quentin Grimes to Spencer Dinwiddie, I'm gonna phrase it like this: If the Mavericks are winning, no one should care who is playing. Period. We talked about this in the preseason. We talked about this in the off season. The whole point of having a smorgasbord of options is so that kid doesn't have to hope one guy is on. Hardy was very good for the first game. Hardy has been not, he was not good against the Suns. He had one turnover in five minutes tonight and got yanked. Spencer was awful, awful for the preseason. Like, I... And he was good tonight. I don't understand it. I don't claim to understand it. I'm just saying that the whole point of this sort of stuff is so kid can try different people in different situations. That's all. People are going to figure this out. And as long as they keep winning, if your agenda is more important than the Mavericks winning, then you're doing this wrong. That's all. Right. Usually this stuff sorts itself out too. So It certainly will because guys are going to start to get hurt. Yeah. And and you just have different people. I'm not I'm not worried about any of this. Now, the only thing I'm actually worried about is if kid sticks with any one option way too long. And that's one thing he's not shown any proclivity to to being married to one of those four guys. He's trying different stuff at different points and hoping that it works. I mean, the Suns game, nothing worked. Nothing worked except for Luca. And even Luca <laughs> what Luca's 40 points and I I I think I said this and if I didn't I'll say it. That was the least impactful 40-point game of Luca's career. He was 6 of 8 in the restricted area or at the rim or something like that and took a lot more shots than 8, tell you that much. And and it's okay. Nobody else was on. The Mavericks lost. Life goes on. We'll figure this out. They'll figure it out. So, I don't know. We're just sort of thinking about where we are. 
No, yeah, and I think like the, if there's two things to take away from the offense, you didn't really see it tonight. Lively and Gafford uh, combined for two assists, but like the two things that are noticeable to me that feel like okay, this might this is something we should like pay attention to and not just be early season noise is the way that they're trusting their centers with the ball at the elbow and trying to run some stuff off of them with entrusting those guys to make the right play. Not saying they're trying to turn Lively or Gafford into like mini Jokic's or or whatever, but you know, like I said, it just it makes a big difference if, uh, if a team can trust their bigs to handle the ball there, and you can do dribble handoffs and and backdoor cuts and stuff like that. Just opens things up, and they've been doing that pretty consistently during what? these three games. So that's one thing, and the other thing is like the clay stuff is fitting as well as we thought. Like he's had he hasn't had a clean three games in terms of shooting. Um, I mean, he's actually been pretty good from three. 45%. He's, yeah. he's 15 of 33. Yeah, from three. He hasn't been great on twos, but that's okay. Uh, but yeah, like the clay stuff is absolutely working like we thought it would. So like those two things I think are are important takeaways from the first Well, three. last thing I do want to talk about and then I want to go. So Sarah in the yeah. chat says, worried about Lucas yapping to the refs this early in the season. This was the first game where it was apparent <laughs> and both calls that he was really livid at, he was... He was right. Like, he was right. Like, Lori was humping him, and then he just put the ball down and ran away. And then the the um, block, because it was a block, that he got called for a technical for, he was right. So, there were also, like, three. There was one instance where he fell down after Walker Kessler challenged his shot and just laid on the ground. I hated that shit. Um but I, I don't know. I've not really thought much about it. Do you have any thoughts? Uh, yeah, this was, I mean, the first two games, I didn't notice the ref complaining stuff at all. Uh, obviously, I had to watch the second game through highlights, so I might not have picked up picked it up. But from what I've heard, he's, I mean, he's been on, a, I would say, through, this, through three games, this is the best behavior. I need, like, a 15-game sample size. I know, yeah. It's still, there, it's, you know? Yeah, that's the thing, is it's so early, and... Uh, the one thing is, again, he could bitch the refs, and the one thing, like, he got his tech during a ball, st- like, stoppage of play. Like, uh-uh. he can, honestly, like, at this point, if he wants to bitch the refs all he wants, whatever, just do it during when the play when the play is dead and uh, he doesn't have to run back and play defense, so otherwise it's fine. Uh, I think people, and this might be me agenda chasing, so I'm sorry, but I do think people need to stop declaring the Najee Marshall trade uh, or move a failure three games in. I know that I, I know I stumped pretty hard um, for him. So I understand I am totally a hundred percent biased because I just personally think he's a good NBA player. And and Derek Derek Jones Jr. Wasn't shit for the Mavericks until game 50. What are we doing? I know he's had three good games with the Clippers. No, there's a lot of it. Like I checked our mentions and it was there. It was happening during the thing. I will say, him doing the Lucas skip after finishing a regular layup was one of the funnier <laughs> things I've seen this season. Yeah, he's one of those guys. He likes yeah. to get, he likes to mix it up. They he need it. Oh, they need some sauce from somebody other than Luca making people insane. No, no, for sure. They need his dribbling and his passing. And I know that he is probably. He does look out of shape. I I agree with anybody that's frustrated with his fitness. Like he doesn't look like there's something about the t-shirt paired with the poor level of play. <laughs> Where I'm just like, there's, there's a, there's something. He kind of looks like, <laughs> I don't want to say it's because he's wearing the t-shirt, but he gives like late career Marcus Morris vibes uh, <laughs> out there. And it doesn't help that they both have beards and they both have the undershirt. That's true. And they both kind of have the same body type, but that's what I was kind of mm-hmm. noticing. Uh, but yeah, you know, I'll, you know, it's early, it's three games. Granted, he's probably not the 38% three point shooter that he was last year in New Orleans. Like, that's probably the outlier. Although, again, it's early, so can he finish he, layups? Like right. he was missing he, layups against he, the Suns, right? Can he finish layups? Can he attack? Can he keep the ball moving? Can he pass? That stuff I care a little bit more about than his than his shooting, because uh, that's what they brought him here. They didn't bring him here to to be an off ball shooter. They brought him here because they felt like the defensive drop off was not going to be as severe, and he can do a little bit more things with the ball in his hands, which they kind of needed. When teams are going to start playing that one-on-one, not double Luca defensive scheme, you need role players that can bail out more possessions. So yep. we'll see. 
It is okay, early. guys. So what, what I'm going to do now, Josh is going to get to go edit a, um, we're going to use a different large word, cornucopia of Dallas Mavs content at MavsMoneyBall.com. Um, you should head on over there at some point today or tomorrow and check out stuff. I'm going to hang around and we're going to do our second live show, which involves your participation. Uh, I've already posted a link in the chat for that, which I want you to click on and, and get in the queue and we can get off our takes and then, then we can go to bed. Uh, <laughs> well, I won't go to bed. I got stuff I got to do. I also started watching arcane last night on Netflix and I want to watch another episode. Good on you. So we'll see what's, we'll see what's happening. So again, Josh and I'll be back tomorrow night. Um, early game against Minnesota against uh, one of my favorite guys to root against, Anthony Edwards. If you haven't seen his latest shoe commercial with the polygraph, it is very good marketing by Adidas. Love it, love it, love it. So, Josh, you got anything before we get out of here? No, sounds good. You have fun tonight. I will have fun. Guys, thanks so much for hanging out, and please continue to hang out. We will be right back. Anybody on an audio stream, look for this a little bit later on. Actually, I'll probably have it up by lunch on uh, on Tuesday. So look for that. Thanks, guys, and go Mavs. <laughs>